wanted vendors to show off their disruptive inventions at the Congressional Expo on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., Wednesday, March 14th from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast, where we share stories of inventors who turn their idea into a product. Please visit our website at www.inventionstories.com. And now, from the Invention Stories Podcast World Headquarters Studios in Morro Bay, California, is our host, Robert Baer. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Baer, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to Episode 43 of the Invention Stories Podcast, James Edwards, The Inventors Project, and the Congressional Expo. As I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, The Inventors Project is hosting the Congressional Expo in the Hart Senate Office Building Room 902 on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. And, at first I thought this was just a great opportunity for inventors to get some great exposure, network with other inventors, entrepreneurs, and elected officials. Now I realize the leaders of the United States need to hear from inventors. We have James Edwards, co-founder of the Inventors Project and CEO of Elite Strategic Services on the line from Washington, D.C. So let's get started. Let me start off because you went to the University of Georgia for your undergraduate and your and your master's, and you went to the University of Tennessee for your PhD. Is that correct? That's right. And uh, why did you choose those two schools to go to? Well, University of Georgia, my father went there, so I was kind of indoctrinated and happily did so. And then Tennessee, they had a very good program in journalism and mass communications that I wanted to pursue at the time I thought I wanted to teach college for a living and then discovered otherwise but uh, they had a very good communications school. Okay so growing up you thought you might want to be a teacher or an educator? Was that well your... on the college level anyway yes. Okay. Uh, what kind of kid were you? Were you interested in inventing or were you uh, did you see yourself as an entrepreneur or? Well I enjoyed building and, and constructing things and playing with like tinker toys and building blocks, building models, things of that nature, as well as, you know, playing active, you know, playing cowboys and Indians and whatnot. But I wouldn't say that my inclinations were to be an inventor. I like to construct things like that I would find in my father's workshop and using his tools and so forth. But I can't say I had anything I invented that I was especially <laughs> proud of or especially notable. It was pretty run-of-the-mill stuff or constructing you know, out of wood blocks and so forth, you know, battleships and, and things like that. They weren't. They were pretty rudimentary. I can't say that they would do more than float. That'd be about it. They, they wouldn't be a candidates for acquisition by the Navy or anything. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, fair enough. Was school, did you like school? I mean, obviously you got your PhD. What did you like about school? Did it come easy to you? Did you like learning or academia? I liked learning, and I wouldn't say I was uh, anything more than a good, solid, you know, B student growing up. The further I went, the more I got... I guess matured and got adept at, at studying and and all of that and, and I always liked reading and learning but uh, kind of the the classroom setting I was pretty comfortable in but the test taking wasn't my strong suit. So I noticed that you mentor. Uh, you're an iron yard mentor and a 1776 mentor. Does that sort of fulfill your sort of college educated teaching that you thought you might do is a, something you really enjoy it does yes that's uh that's certainly one outlet for my teaching inclinations i do love to share things i've learned and part uh, insights to others and mentoring through those business accelerator programs has been one outlet in that direction no, I, I enjoy uh, teaching. I just don't find too many people want to listen to me. I did teach, you know, as a graduate teaching assistant and at my graduate level and then as a in a couple of college programs and 
And it's a whole lot different when it's someone who wants to be there or is seeking your input because they want to know something, not because they have to be there to check the box and get the credit for the class or whatever it may be. So that's where the mentoring thing or the upper level course of teaching has been more rewarding from that point of view. If I was in in love with the subject matter, uh, probably going to get an A because I'm pretty competitive and I sort of struggled when I uh, had zero passion and as a uh, business student there's just too many dry classes you know but uh, (laughs) (laughs) you're the the owner of Elite Strategic Services is that correct? Yes. And how did you come from getting your PhD to uh, running your own business? What was that journey like? It looks like you've you've lived a whole lifetime between the two. I just wanted to touch on some of the things that you've done because You've had a really interesting uh, career so far. Well, I guess I've kind of pieced it together, and it all is integrated, but it's just you never would have plotted the course taken on the outset. From one point of view, I wanted to, to teach college, but I wanted to be someone who could teach college with real-world experience instead of just teaching from the book and no real-world experience. So I was always interested in public policy and and history and and those kinds of things. So I went to work on Capitol Hill in Washington. That's my first real job out of college. Worked in the U.S. Senate, and I thought I was on top of the world, even though I was on the lowest possible ring on the uh, (laughs) career ladder in that place, that uh, career started very low, chasing down Social Security checks and and helping people with those kinds of matters. But before long, it led to to other opportunities. You know, I kind of went back and forth in working in Congress and then working in some business settings, worked in advertising section for a grocer's cooperative, worked in the claims for a property casualty insurance company, And in each of those, I was thinking, why can't I get where I want to go from here? And I seem to be going down these these side tracks, but it all kind of worked together. What I learned in each of those was valuable and applicable things later on in my career. So I eventually came back to Washington, having gotten a doctorate and done a little bit of college teaching and, and learning that that really wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so, you know, a couple of more stints in the legislative and press secretary sides of the congressional work from there went to a, a health care trade association, was an executive at the association for several years. So that's kind of the path that led me to an opportunity to go into consulting. Now, it was a, the first gig as a consultant was more of a going in with a friend who wanted to establish a consulting firm in the public policy arena and public affairs. And so the two of us just went in and started a firm. And, and after several years, a, a uh, headhunter came and, and plucked me and took me to a different firm so I took my book of business with me and um, and then at a certain point that the circumstances at that firm changed significantly it was just it was a mutual decision but it just the best decision was to go on my own so in 2013 headed out for the solo track. So here I am at the uh, at Elite Strategic Services with several iterations of consulting to get to this point. So what is your primary focus that people hire you for? Who, who's your, uh, who do you work most with? It's a combination of trade associations, national trade associations, private companies, corporations, including some like intellectual ventures, and then others are nonprofits, and then some startups and early stage companies. So it's a mix. But what they hire me to do is to give 
either analysis or insight, uh, strategic advice on those areas, particularly healthcare and intellectual property as subject areas. But uh, with the healthcare, particularly, that's a heavily regulated sector. And so you see a lot of people have some great ideas, but then they really it's kind of, they don't know what they don't know. And if you follow 23andMe, they felt like a few more million dollars of somebody else's investor's money, we can ignore the Food and Drug Administration and its whole set of regulations. <laughs> and they found out otherwise that, you know, you've got to know the lay of the land and you've got to abide by the regulations and the laws and, and not think you can do something without being held accountable to that. And that's just part of it is, is helping people understand what the lay of the land is regulatorily and all of that. And then the feature I add to that is looking at what is developing in the legislative front on the regulatory front and identify what bills and proposed regulations that are developing that would affect somebody's business strategy and then help them to factor those potential and likely changes into their business plan, their business strategy. So it's making adjustments to what's coming instead of just being caught unawares. So you follow the bills that are going through Congress that well, affect not either... all of them, just ones that people pay me to watch. No, no, I meant uh, for, for anything that's sort of healthcare related or intellectually property related. Yes. Wow. Do you read the whole bills? Well, whatever the bill is, I would probably read it if we, depending if it were moving, but uh, otherwise I would probably just look at synopses. Depends what the bill, what the situation is. If it's a thousand page bill that's introduced and there's really no chance of it going anywhere, it's not the best use of time to read it in its entirety. But if it's something that's a 10 page bill and it is definitely going to move, then I'll read that one several times. Wow, I, I didn't know that. I, I don't have a very good sense. I'm out here in California and I just, you know, see the news every so often and what I've learned about bills and how they become laws and. What I learned from Schoolhouse Rock, you know, I'm just a bill. So what you're saying is that if a bill's only got like 10 pages, it has a better chance of getting through than something that has a 1,000 pages? No, I'm not saying that at all. Oh. Um, I'm just saying it's more of a qualitative decision to read an entire bill, regardless of how short or long it is. You have to assess kind of what its prospects are as far as realistically moving or not most you know frankly most bills that are introduced never see the light of day there'd be three or four thousand bills in a single congress introduced and just you know maybe just a handful a few hundred would be moved and the majority of those that move are non-controversial items right. and that would include things like naming post offices and so forth Huh, I didn't know that. I can uh, get through that bill pretty quickly, <laughs> the post office naming bill. Yeah, I, yeah, I would imagine any change in the health care bill, any sort of health care change is probably met with all kinds of obstacles. Is that what you find? Yes, because health care is a complex industry, and so there are multiple layers of regulation, multiple layers of interests, and so it can be very complex very quickly in healthcare or tax or other complex subject areas. But some are more straightforward than others. But you know, if you look at what are, are the more regulated ones, heavy industry, energy, things like that, you know, healthcare is certainly among the more re highly regulated. How about intellectual property? Um... Is there any sort of change that you would like to see as, in regards to intellectual property law or, or, or change that you think would really help inventors? Well, there's, there certainly are a number that would be improvements. I'd say 
one of them is if they were to eliminate some of the changes made in 2011 in the America Invents Act, I'm sure you're aware that the America Invents Act was fairly broad-reaching and has had some uh, serious consequences. One thing that's probably the most harmful in terms of its effect at this point is the post-grant review proceedings that were established at the Patent and Trademark Office called post-grant review. Interpartis review is one of those. Covered business method review is another. Those things have been fairly problematic, especially interpartis review. The way it was implemented makes it easy to challenge a patent's validity, and it, it's been implemented in a way that kind of tilts in favor of the infringer instead of the inventor mm. or the patent owner. Yeah, we don't like the sound of that. But that's, I mean, that's, that's out there, and that's been the subject of a lot of comment and hand-wringing, and is currently at issue in the oil states versus greens energy group case that the Supreme Court heard recently. So that may be a judicial fix rather than a legislative fix. Other things, you know, there have been a host of uh, rulings and courts and legislation over the past couple of decades. Uh, one springs to mind was a Supreme Court ruling in a case called eBay, and yes, it's that eBay, that makes it very hard to get an injunction to stop an infringer from continuing to make the knockoff of your invention. So if you don't have injunctive relief, unable to stop the infringer from continually using your invention, your negotiating leverage is pretty low, even though you prove in, in court that they are infringing your patent. So that would be good to overturn. Those are a couple of examples of uh, some things that would uh, be a quick uh, improvement for inventors. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I, I always talk to inventors, and a lot of them seem really frustrated that they can get a patent, and yet if somebody infringes on their patent, if they try to fight them in court, they're you know told that it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and at any time that person can just sort of or company just kind of disappear or whatever, and you're stuck holding the bag. I don't know if that's really the case, but I keep hearing that. Has that been any of your experience that it's just really expensive to try to fight these uh, patent infringers? Yes, it's it's unfortunately um, an expensive endeavor to defend your property your intellectual property, the only recourse you have, you know, there's no patent police, so your only recourse you have is, is uh, civil litigation, which involves lawyers and fees and takes a lot of time. It's draining, drains your time and your resources of all sorts, drains your energy, and meanwhile, the infringer keeps infringing, so <laughs> they're developing the market on your invention. So it's entirely frustrating. I mean, it's always been that way, expensive, uncertain, and not entirely guaranteed that the, the right person wins. So it's, yeah, that's the nature of that area of law, unfortunately. You're having a, a big get together on Capitol Hill with inventors who want to show off their inventions? Yes, yes. Happy to talk about that. Please do. One. One of the hats I wear is co-director of something called the Inventors Project. And the Inventors Project does some educational programs around the country as well as in Washington. The part of the program in Washington is we'll hold briefings to educate congressional staff and interested folks on some topic related to invention or commercialization of inventions. And so out of that, one thing we had done about four or five years ago was to start a Congressional Inventions Caucus. The Congressional Inventions Caucus is both in the House and in the Senate, and it's bipartisan. It has Senator Hazy Hirono of Hawaii, 
and Senator Steve Daines of Montana as the Democrat and Republican, respectively, uh, co-chairing that caucus in the Senate. In the House, it's Congressman Paul Gosar of Arizona and Congressman Bill Foster of Illinois, Republican and Democrat, respectively. What the caucus does is holds events. Some are closed events where staff are briefed by some speaker. Like one time we had a patent attorney come in and explain to these congressional staff, none of whom have ever applied for a patent themselves, and just the patent attorney walked through the process of putting together a patent application, the examination process, the fee structure, and all that kind of thing, just the brass tacks of pursuing a patent, prosecuting a patent. And then another time we had an investor come in and talk about how investors view patents and uh, intellectual property as they assess those who are asking for a monetary investment. And so the other part of it is we have more expo type events, and that's the one that you have referenced as upcoming. And these are opportunities to have some program that's a little bit educational along those lines, but also to, to interact, provide an opportunity for senators and congressmen and staff and others to interact with inventors who will be there and show their inventions. The one that is coming up is, if you're going to be in the Washington, D.C. area, will be on Wednesday, March 14th, and it's uh, the afternoon starts at 4 o'clock, and the subject is how to evaluate disruptive inventions. This will be with a panel of speakers. One is Winslow Sargent. He is the IEEE USA's Entrepreneurship Policy and Innovation Committee, and he used to be in charge of the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy. And so that's one of the speakers. We've got a patent attorney. You may read IP Watchdog online. Gene Quinn is the publisher and editor of IP Watchdog, and he's also a patent attorney. He'll be one of our panelists. And then we have someone, a faculty member from Carnegie Mellon University, and the entrepreneur in residence named Craig Markowitz. And so those three will give some insights on the valuation of inventions that are a bit more of the disruptive nature rather than just simply iterative improvements. So that's coming up again on Wednesday the 14th of March, 4 o'clock Eastern Time Senate building, Senate office building called HART, H-A-R-T, it's room 1902. There will be a some publicity around that, uh, getting the word out about it as we finalize the invitation, and that should be available very soon. So I'd be happy to get that to you. Yes, and uh, is there a website that people can go to in reference to find this information? It will be on the website for the Inventors Project, and it may be on IEEE USA's, but I'm not certain about that. Those are the two co-hosts of the event in terms of institutions, Inventors Project and IEEE USA. We're doing this in conjunction with the Senate Inventions Caucus. I'll put some of that information uh, on the show notes there. I've been wanting to get uh, Gene Quinn on, and now I've got a a really good reason, so he can help explain (laughs) from his point of view. Well, I like to have things sort of build on each other and get different points of view. I want to thank you for taking your time today, and I just had uh, I had a question before I, I let you go, and that's the question I ask everybody. If, if there's an inventor out there and he's got an idea, and he, he asks you for advice, what advice would you give him or that person? I think I'd say, assuming this is a new inventor, not someone seasoned, but someone just kind of starting on their first invention, Sure. I would encourage them to talk generally to some others so plugging into the local inventors club and organizations like that or finding an individual who is a a local inventor and just 
picking their brain about basic stuff. You know, how do you keep an inventor's notebook and, and things like that? Don't disclose about your invention. Keep that closely held. But that's the other piece is don't, you can be enthusiastic, but be enthusiastic without disclosing things that will turn your invention into prior art and therefore not patentable. So that's a problem oftentimes with faculty inventors. <laughs> They're used to uh, putting stuff out and disclosing details that may be great for them tenure-wise in terms of in an academic publication, but they end up hurting themselves and rendering their own invention not patentable by public disclosure. So that's a careful thing to be aware of where the line is and how not to dig yourself a hole of that sort. And then the third thing I'd say is think in terms of commercialization. Even from the beginning, as you're thinking about what the invention is and how it's going to work, you know, what's it going to take to make it work, thinking about where do I go once I get this determined and figured out, getting the patent isn't the end of the game. That's just really the start of the game in terms of if you intend to commercialize it. And so identify some entities that can be helpful to you. There's Edison Nation is one that has a, a great track record of helping independent inventors to find and marry up with manufacturers and designers and so forth who can help to speed the commercialization of your invention into products. On the West Coast, Stephen Key is a very good resource. So those are some things I would suggest to novice inventors or beginning inventors. One more thought, and it relates to what I was talking about a moment ago about public disclosure. This includes, I'd encourage people to be very careful about what they put in a, a PowerPoint or something they will show or share, because even that constitutes public disclosure, and even if you're showing it in a, a fairly small setting. So you want to be very careful about what you put on a slide that could be disclosing things that are relating to your patent claims. And the other thought I had to build on all of those suggestions is find a patent attorney who has the ability to help you in your specific area. Some are a bit more focused on one technology type or another. So find someone who is a patent attorney in the area in which you're inventing. There are a lot of good patent attorneys, but if you're doing something on solar energy, then the guy who's a specialist in biotechnology and life sciences may not be the best fit. So do some shopping around to find the right fit for you. That's really smart. I think people just, they want to go with a reputation or somebody local. And it seems like you might save some time get a better patent written up for you or a stronger patent because that person's already thought of all those answers and questions and, you know, that, that's brilliant. Well, they certainly want to know your technology in terms of the specific invention because only you would know that as the inventor, but they would know the questions to ask. They would know the nature of the particular types of common hiccups or problem areas or things that can be facilitating in that particular technology. So that's why I say you know, they may be a little bit more expensive. They may be a little bit less to your liking in terms of personality or something. But all in all, it all comes down to the strength of the patent claims and the clarity of the patent claims in your application. And that's what your money is buying, is them translating an idea in your mind and in your notes into something that can convince a patent examiner at the patent office that, hey, this is legitimate, this will work, and this patent claim is substantiated, and this patent claim is substantiated, and you don't have weak patent claims. You've been listening to episode 43 of the Invention Stories podcast, James Edwards, The Inventors Project, and the Congressional Expo. 
and I would like to thank James Edwards for being our guest today. More information can be found at www.inventorsproject.org. To learn more about Elite Strategic Services, please visit www.elitestrap.com. And for more information can be found in the show notes on our website, inventionstories.com. If you would like to become a sponsor of the Invention Stories podcast or have a suggestion on how we can make it better, please contact us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we invite you to write a positive review for us on iTunes. An easy way to get there is to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash review. Thank you very much for listening today and please tell a friend.